Hello and welcome to a weekly Sunday online from Christ Church St. James uh, in Etobicoke, West Toronto. It's really great you would spend some time with us today. Um, we're in our third year of just um, offering this little online ministry each week to folks. Initially to folks who would normally inhabit this building on a Sunday, but because of the pandemic that changed things dramatically for quite some time. We're gradually getting back to whatever normal was, though I don't think, I think it'll be a new normal. But also, the uh, online opportunity opened doors, if you like, to meet many new people, new to us. And it's been a real honor to interact with many people from across uh, Ontario, uh, across Canada, and well beyond the shores. So. We're, we welcome you today. We're, we simply have been walking through what's known as the Gospel according to John. It's an account of the life of Jesus, um, a portrait, if you like, helping us appreciate this big picture of who Jesus is, why he came, what he did, and how does that relate to any of us in our lives today? What will our lives look like, basically is the question, if we gave this serious consideration? So that's the big deal. So it's not just reading for the sake of reading. It's reading to reflect and to let something sink in deep. And uh, hopefully he do a work inside of us that needs to be done. I know that I am definitely uh, in need of a lot of work. So... Thank you. And so we're going to pray. I'm going to read a little bit, um, reflect a little bit. I think I'm going to share a story, actually, today. And then uh, maybe a song at the end, okay? So let's just begin by praying. Father, I do thank you for this. I believe it's the 33rd time we've gathered around the Book of John together uh, since October. But I'm very grateful for anyone who is gathering around it with us for the very first time right now. And I would pray, Lord, that all of us would be in a place to listen and to let truth sink in deep and do its work in our lives. Lord, you are all about peace and you are all about beauty and you're all about restoration and healing, and hope, and life. Please, may all of that and more reach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the 19th chapter of John. If you happen to have a New Testament handy or a gospel handy, if you don't have one and you really like one, um, we will we send this out for free to you, and you can get a hold of us. The information is at the very end of this little video, as far as our address is concerned. You can get you can get you can give us a call or an email or whatever you want to do, and we will send this to you right away. So if you happen to have one, please turn to the 19th chapter of John, and uh, I'll just confess, this is there's a whole lot here. And I think what I'm just going to do, I'm going to read a good, good portion. And then I'm going to share a story about all of this. Because um, we could, we spend a lot of time, and rightly so, but never enough time. We'd never say enough. Here, here it comes, beginning at verse 17 of John chapter 19. So Pilate has handed Jesus over to be crucified. And uh, they took charge of Jesus, right? Verse 17. He went out carrying his cross, and he came to the place of the skull, as it's called. And there they crucified him. And they also crucified two other men, one on each side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. Now, many people read it because 
the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city. And the notice was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now the chief priest said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written stays written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They took the robe, which was made of one piece of woven cloth, without any seam in it. And the soldiers said to one another, Let's not tear it. Let's throw dice to see who can get it. And this happened in order to make the scripture come true. They divided my clothes among them and gambled for my robe. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. That's John, most likely. So he said to his mother, he is your son. And then he said to the disciple, she is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her to live in his own home. We'll just read a little bit more. Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed. And in order to make the scripture come true, he said, I'm thirsty. A bowl was there full of cheap wine. So a sponge was soaked in the wine and put on a stalk of hyssop and lifted up to his lips. And Jesus drank the wine and said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Yeah, well, stop right there. I mentioned I'm just going to tell a story. And uh, it's one that I've shared a few times. In fact, I heard this story when I was 17 years old from a young couple that came to the church I was a part of in Victoria, B.C. at the time. And uh, it's amazing that I remember anything from being 17 years old, but I do remember this story. And here it is. Once upon a time, there was a king who loved his people. And his kingdom was a place of absolute beauty, peace, joy, harmony and laughter, life. People loved that kingdom, and people loved that king. People knew if there ever were a problem or a need or a concern, they were welcome to walk right up to the castle of the king. The door would be wide open. And the king would invite them right into his home to hear their concern and to resolve their problems. I mean, nothing could be better. There was much joy in that kingdom, for there was much love for that king. But time can be a funny thing, right? People began to forget why they had it so good. Some convinced themselves the kingdom just happened <laughs> by chance. Others began to take credit for the kingdom. Very few remembered the king. And life became less peaceful in that kingdom. People wanted more. Taking, robbing, fighting, even killing to get more. And it became quite dark. And the beauty was barely visible. And the king looked down from his castle and he wept. His love for his people had not diminished. Even while they seemed bent on destroying everything he created for them. To reawaken their memories of how life was meant to be lived, he arranged to have a list of kingdom principles circulated throughout the realm and posted for everyone to see. And surely if people just took a moment to read those principles or guidelines, if you like, for kingdom living, they'd be drawn back into a community of peace once again. Well, how did people respond to those kingdom principles and guidelines? Well, some feared 
We better obey those rules or the king will come down hard upon us. Some scoffed. Not a chance. Who does the king think he is to tell us how to live our lives? It's my life. And others couldn't even be bothered. They never even stopped to take a look or a glance. What rules? I don't see any rules. And the kingdom became all the darker, bleak, and cruel. And when the king realized his guidelines had been ignored, he did the most amazing thing. He took off his crown. He took off that robe and that ring. He put on a jacket and jeans and sneakers. He left his castle and he walked right into the center of that kingdom dressed like that. People didn't recognize him. And over time, he began to speak about the king and about the kingdom, of how it all began, of what life used to be like, of what life could be like again. And many were captivated by the pictures he painted with his words. Many gathered around him. They hung on every word. Some actually left everything behind just to be close to him. There was something about this man. He spoke in such a convincing and inviting manner as if he knew the king personally. People could not get enough, not only of his words, but of his company. There was something about this man that just gave them hope. But others were not quite so enamored by this man. You don't know what is true, they said. He responded, I am the truth. You know nothing about what life is like for us. I am the life. Who are you to speak about the king to us? I am the king. And with that, they turned on him and they tore at his clothing and brutally murdered him, look out, in the name of the king. Yeah, once upon a time there was a king who loved his people. He was God. You've got it all figured out. The king of the universe. And his kingdom was a place of absolute beauty. Peace and joy and harmony and laughter, life, love. People loved that kingdom because people loved that king, the Lord. And they knew if there were ever a problem or a need or a concern, they were welcome to ask, seek, and knock, to cast all their care on him, for they knew he cared for them. Nothing could have been better. There was much joy in that kingdom because there was so much love for that king, the Lord. But again, as mentioned earlier, time can be a funny thing. People began to forget why they had it so good. And some convinced themselves that the world had just happened just by chance. Others began to take credit for the world. Very few remembered the Lord. And life became less peaceful in the world. People wanted more. Taking, robbing, fighting, killing. And it became very dark. And the beauty was barely visible. And God looked down from above and wept. His love for his people had not diminished, even while they seemed bent on destroying everything he'd created for them. To reawaken their memories of how life was meant to be, he arranged to have a list of ten principles circulated throughout his realm, posted for everybody to see. Surely if people just took a moment to read these guidelines, all, of, all relational guidelines, by the way, relating to him, relating to one another, they'd be drawn back into community 
and back into peace again. But how did people respond to those ten kingdom principles? Well, some feared. We better obey these rules or God will come down hard on us. Some scoffed. Not a chance. Who does God think he is to tell me how to live my life? It's my life. And others could not be bothered. Didn't even stop. What rules? And the world became darker, bleak, and cruel. And when God recognized that his rules, guidelines had been ignored, he did the most amazing thing. We just read about it in the last 19 chapters of John. He took off his robe and his crown and his ring. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He left it all behind. He came right to the center of it all, dwelling among us, John 1.14. His own people didn't recognize him. And over time, he began to speak about God and about his kingdom and how it all began, how it used to be, how it could be again. And many were captivated by the pictures he painted with his words. Many gathered around him, hanging on every word. Some actually left everything behind, dropped everything just to be near him. There was something about this man. He spoke in such a convincing and inviting manner, not like the religious leaders, by the way. It was as if he knew God personally. People could not get enough, not only of his words, but of his company. There was something about this man that gave them hope. But others were not quite so enamored, right? Who are you to tell us what is true? I am the truth. You know nothing about what life is like. I've come to give you life in all its fullness. You haven't a clue about the king. I am the king. And with that chanting, we have no king but Caesar. They turned on him and they tore at his clothing and brutally murdered him in the name of God. However, unlike our first story, this was not the end. We haven't finished John yet. <laughs> those same hands, those suffering hands that were nailed to wood for your sin and mine, the very hands that formed and fashioned the world he would actually give his life for, those same hands that would bring healing, that would feed, that would bless, that would calm storms, that would take authority over demons, that would lift, that would encourage, would soon be hands that would bring assurance and hope to all who would question. As we'll see in the next chapter, Thomas, Jesus says, behold my hands. The same hands became hands of invitation for all those who have ears to hear. And those same hands, as mind-boggling as this must sound to some, are ready to dry every tear from every eye that sees Christ as Savior and Christ as Lord. Their hands of forgiveness, their hands of welcome, their hands of eternal companionship for all who recognize him, as the king who truly loves his people. This is the good news story that we've been wading through for 33 weeks together. My prayer is simple, that we will make it our own story, that we will allow that story to define our lives, that we will place our very lives 
into those hands that gave his life for you and me. There's a lovely song I heard a number of years ago, and uh, maybe you know it. I'll play it. I didn't write it. <laughs> um. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for your nail pierced hands wash me in your cleansing flow now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne crown you now with many crowns you reign victorious high and lifted up Jesus son of God the treasure of heaven crucified worthy is the Lamb Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for those nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now. With many crowns you reign victorious. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. <clears throat> it's been a really, it's been a really horrible week in the world, hasn't it? And um, I, I don't need to, you know it. Hearts are breaking. I came home last week and my wife was just in tears because of what's going on in our world. Texas, Ukraine. So much. The world is so broken. The world is so bruised. It's not getting better. I know we've all heard it all, so I should stop. But just to say, we need help. We need help desperately. And not just the world, we individually, all of us, if we take an honest look in the mirror, we're not who we're supposed to be. And yet, that's why Jesus came. Just as the story tried to illustrate, that's why Jesus came. I just end by saying, he's all about beauty. 
He's all about peace. He's all about forgiveness. He's all about healing. He's all about restoration. Why on earth would we leave him standing outside in the cold? My prayer for you today, I hope this is, I hope that this has been said kindly in a way that you can relate to, is that you would just open the door. And when you open the door to Jesus, you open the door to beauty. And you open the door to peace. And you open the door to forgiveness. And you open the door to healing and restoration in life. You really do. So that's my prayer. <laughs> that you might just simply open the door. I do pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you big time. Thanks so much.